Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 125. I'm just back from a genealogy conference in Mesa, Arizona, and I want to welcome all the new listeners to the show. We had a wonderful time, as always, and I got a chance to present a brand new class on using Evernote for genealogy. Boy, oh boy, did that spark up some family historians in the audience. (laughs) People kept stopping by our exhibit booth and talking about the class and sharing how they plan to use Evernote for their family history research. So that was a lot of fun. And while I was at the Mesa Family History Expo, I took the opportunity to sit down with genealogist and author Shirley Gage Hodges to talk about really a wide range of topics. I know you're going to enjoy them. So that is coming up a little bit later in this episode. But right now I'm back at home and catching up on email. And I just got a note from Marilyn, who attended one of my classes. It was called Inspiring Ways to Captivate the Non-Genealogist in Your Life, which, by the way, I will also be presenting at Roots Tech at the end of this month in February 2012. Marilyn writes, I attended your class during the Arizona Family History Expo. I enjoyed it very much. I wanted to share with you what I did to hopefully get my family interested in genealogy. Our twin grandsons turned 16 years old last December. I wanted to make them something that would be of great worth. So I made them quilts. Not ordinary quilts, but very special quilts. I put fabric from their father's shirts, their grandfather's shirts, and their great-grandfather's shirts into each quilt. These quilts will last a long time and be very special to them for many years. When they opened their quilts, one boy carefully folded his quilt back up, but the other one took the quilt out and wrapped it around his shoulders. Both of them showed that they loved their treasures. Well, isn't that great? I mean, creating new heirlooms like Marilyn did is just as important, I think, as doing our research because it brings in the next generation and ultimately that's going to ensure that they care about the family history work that you've done and they're going to protect it and share it for years to come. So thank you so much for writing and sharing that, Marilyn. Oh, and by the way, uh, I was mentioning Roots Tech. You know, I think I mentioned in a past episode that I was going to be teaching on using the iPad for genealogy at Roots Tech. In fact, Roger and Susan both wrote in saying that they were anxious to attend that session. Um, But actually, I am not teaching that class at Roots Tech. (laughs) That was me confusing all the upcoming presentations and traveling that I'm going to be doing in the next couple of months. Um, Actually, I believe Lisa also will be teaching that class on the iPad at Roots Tech. But I'll be teaching on the same subject at the National Genealogical Society Conference in May of 2012 in Cincinnati, Ohio. So if you're going to be attending the NGS conference, of course, I'd love to see you in class. You know, my travel and my speaking schedule is really picking up steam lately. So I have a few blonde moments now and then. If you really want to know where I'm speaking and what I'm speaking on, the thing to do is to go to the Genealogy Gems website at genealogygems.com and click seminars in the menu. That's what I do to make sure that I'm in the right place at the right time. And speaking of conferences, the 43rd annual Southern California Genealogical Society Jamboree is now officially open for registration. And their website is scgsgenealogy.com. And I'll have the longer link that takes you directly into the Jamboree registration on the show notes for this episode. Now, I'm going to be there again this year, probably along with about 1,700 other genealogists for one of the biggest family history shindigs of the year. We are all going to once again be meeting up in Burbank, California, starting on June 8th. It's going to run through the 10th of 2012. Now, this incredibly popular conference um, is going to be held at the Los Angeles Marriott Burbank Airport Hotel. It's at 2500 Hollywood Way in Burbank, California, right across from the airport. And there are going to be pre-events, such as the Family History Writers Conference and Tech Tracks on Thursday, June 7th. 
And this year, I'm actually really excited to play a very special role in the Family History Writers Conference. So you're going to be hearing about that in the coming weeks. Stay tuned. But for now, head over to the show notes page for this episode by going to genealogygems.com, clicking podcast in the menu, and just navigate your way to episode 125 for more information. Um, There's a lot of information already available, even this far in advance, for Jamboree. Um, On their website, they've got information about the speakers, the schedule. They've got an exhibit hall map. Uh, Of course, information on hotel reservations, maps and directions, local resources and sites. Of course, there's so much to see in that area. Uh, And any other questions that you might have. So definitely, and if you're thinking about going, I would say the earlier you book your hotel, the better. (laughs) Because it gets really filled up. And finally, the biggest news that I have for you is that my brand new book, I think I mentioned it to you in the last episode that it's coming. It's called Everything You Need to Know About How to Find Your Family History in Newspapers. It's now available for pre-order. And for a limited time, I am going to be signing the pre-order copies of the book. Shipping is scheduled to start right around February 6th of 2012. So we'll be taking pre-orders for the book and those copies I'll be signing at least up until that point. Now, we brought some advanced copies of the book with us to the Mesa Family History Expo and they sold out the first day, actually early in the first day. (laughs) You know, the thing is, there hasn't been a book on newspaper research, not a comprehensive book since like the 1980s. And of course, there's never been a book that compiled and included all of the online and internet resources. And that's what this is going to be. Now, just to be sure that this book hit the mark and covered everything that it needed to, I had a newspaper man take a look at it. Yep, our friend Steve Luxenberg, he's associate editor at the Washington Post, and he's author, of course, of the terrific book, Annie's Ghosts. He read it cover to cover, and, well, here's his quote that you will find on the back cover of the book. Read it, study it, absorb it. But above all, use Lisa Louise Cook's new book as the guide and instructional tool that it is meant to be. As a veteran of research in libraries, I found all sorts of nuggets and new resources. Beginners will find an embarrassment of riches, including an impressive index with a comprehensive list of online routes to national, international, and local newspapers. This is as close as you'll get to one-stop shopping for learning about historical newspaper research. And really... That's what I really wanted it to be. One-stop shopping for everything that you need to know about finding your family history in newspapers. It's a tough challenge because they are all over the place. And some are online, lots are offline, and it really helps to have a process and have all the information and all the resources there in one place. That's the idea behind the book. There are some incredible stories out there. They're just waiting to be found and... um, this book is going to get you there. So to get your signed copy of How to Find Your Family History in Newspapers, just head over to genealogygems.com. We've got a picture of the cover of the book right there on the front page. Just click it, and it's going to take you to the pre-order page. And trust me, you're going to love it. (laughs) I found so many things new on my family just in putting the book together and using all the resources as I went through it. So uh, I know you're going to have a great success with it. Okay, well, coming up next, we're going to do something that I also love to do, which is hear from you. So I will see you over at the mailbox. Letter 
from my hometown. Not long ago, I got a very interesting email question from Myron from Iowa. He writes, I have a genealogical gem that I think that you would like to hear about. I have a recording of my great-grandma's voice. My father served in the Army from 1946 to 1950. Sometime while he was in the service, his family took a trip from Nebraska to New York City. While visiting the Empire State Building at the top, there was this coin-operated machine that would cut your own record, recording your voice, that you could mail to your friends. My mom has that record. I recorded the record to a WAV file, and it sounds really bad. I don't understand German, so I hope they aren't saying anything bad. Enclosed are some photos of it and the WAV files from it. So, let's take a listen to Myron's great-grandmother's voice from over 60 years ago. Yes, my nephew, Chris Lichtermeyer in New York. I spreche von dir hier von der Empire State Building. All of you in the sky about... Then maybe uh, the light on the side that you will not want to go to see the things and so on the wider and so wider. The morning we went on both sides, three more times over, and in the museum, part of the society, so the gang is in and out of my mother's home there. So we're talking to you, and here's your cousin Clay, Clay Bissemeyer, and here you are. I just want to talk a couple of ways to you, just want to let you know that you are your father and your nephew and nieces and all here. We had a good and nice time. You look New York over. I just got talking to all the houses in the park. So you were ahead of you. So I hope someday you will come over too and visit us. So uh, I wonder who is coming from you next year. I hope you're all all right. I like, I like to see you. To me, it actually sounds like his grandmother is in the background, and there's a man who's saying that he's a cousin talking. And it sounds, of course, both like German and also English. Very interesting. First of all, I'll ask, is there anyone out there who speaks German who could translate this recording from Myron? If that's something that you can help us with, That would be amazing. Please email the written translation to me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. And if someone is able to do that, then I will definitely share the results here on the show. Secondly, there was some kind of genealogical serendipity involved in this email from Myron because I had come across a video on YouTube that I thought was absolutely wonderful, and it's right along the same lines. The video is from StoryCorps, and it's called No More Questions. The video can be found on the Vimeo.com website, and it's very similar to Myron's recording in that it was done in New York City in a StoryCorps booth, uh, kind of the modern-day version of the booth that uh, Myron was talking about at the top of the Empire State Building. Now, Kay Wang was a strong-willed grandmother who was reluctantly taken to a StoryCorps booth by her son and her granddaughter. Though Kay resisted, she still had stories to tell. From disobeying her mother and rebuffing suitors while growing up in China, to late-life adventures as a detective for Bloomingdale's department store. Kay passed away just a few weeks after the interview, and her son and her granddaughter returned to StoryCorps to remember her gentler side, which she often kept to herself. Here's an excerpt of the audio from that video. I wasn't very nice. If I make a mistake, my mother, she made me apologize. In our custom, when you apologize to your mother, you have to bring a cup of tea and say, I'm sorry. 
but I purposely dropped a hot cup of tea in my mother's lap. <laughs> and I wasn't a good student. I always lied to get out of school because a lot of boyfriends after me. <laughs> that time I was still young, I was not bad looking then. <laughs> so what else? Hurry, hurry, I'm going to go home. How'd you meet Grandpa? I was a training nurse in a hospital. He was there for hemorrhoids operation. So when your grandpa see me, your grandpa keep on asking me to get married. And I said, I don't like you. You, you have bald head. <laughs> I didn't like him because he's ugly. But one thing about your grandpa, he's very smart. That's it. No more question. <laughs> Just a couple more questions. Short one. Short ones. Short ones. Tell me about working at Bloomingdale's. What did you do? You know what I do. I'm not going to tell no, you. No, you have to. You have to talk about it. I am a detective. <laughs> <laughs> I got a very famous designer. I better not mention her name. She stole a dress, three thousand some dollar. So I walk out of store. I said, would you like to pay me that dress? <laughs> she said, do you know who I am? I said, yeah, you're a thief. <laughs> so that's my life. <laughs> do you have any regrets? No, what should I regret? No, I think I'm old enough to do whatever I would like. And that's it. <laughs> You know, there's a line between independent and stubborn, and my mom crossed that a lot. She liked to complain about things, but she didn't really mind. Like, she took care of Grandpa, and she did a lot of that on her own. You knew because she complained about it, but she would do it, even though she complained. Yeah. I don't know how willing she would have been to do StoryCorps if she actually didn't know she had so little time left. It was kind of like one of her last gifts to us. My mother was cremated, and the original plan was to put her in the same cremora as Next to my Grandpa. <laughs> but she said, you know, keep me at your place for a while. So uh, right now I have the ashes at home. And uh, I talk to my mom every now and then. I'll tell her good night or I miss you or something like that. So I'm kind of happy she's with me. This story is just wonderful, and you've really got to see the video for yourself. I'm going to have it for you in the show notes. Again, it's called No More Questions. And what's really cool about this is all this audio you've been listening to is actually set to kind of a cartoon, very much in a Disney type of style. Uh, you've got to see it to really um, appreciate it and enjoy it. And I'll have links to other StoryCorps videos for you also in the show notes. They're really, really well done. And StoryCorps is out of Brooklyn, New York. They're at StoryCorps.org. Their mission is to provide Americans of all backgrounds and beliefs with the opportunity to record, share, and preserve the stories of our lives. I know you're going to enjoy it. And Myron, thank you so much for being the catalyst for this topic. And uh, I look forward to hearing from any of you German speakers out there. Hope you can help us out. Okay, well, coming up next, I've got Shirley Gage Hodges for you. And that's right after this. Bring me a letter from my proud old dad Who knows that we are winning and I'll be for more than any other, a line from my old mother. Bring me a letter from my hometown. Hey 
Are you looking to take the next step in your family history research and start recording your family tree in your own genealogy database? Or are you looking to make a switch to a more user-friendly genealogy software program? When my listeners and students ask me which program I prefer, I always recommend Roots Magic. It's the program I decided to make the switch to a couple of years ago, and I am so glad I did. You just won't find a more powerful genealogy software program, and building your family tree is easier than ever with the new Roots Magic 4. With Roots Magic, you can add unlimited facts, find anyone in your database with lightning speed with Roots Magic Explorer quickly and easily create perfectly formatted sources with the Roots Magic Source Wizard. It makes it so easy. You can create customized reports, and best of all, you can now take Roots Magic wherever your research takes you with Roots Magic to go, which lets you run Roots Magic directly off your flash drive. And Roots Magic makes it a snap to share your family history. You know how important I think that is. It'll help you publish a book, create stunning wall charts, shareable CDs, even create websites automatically from your data. Really, what are you waiting for? Download your risk-free trial of Roots Magic 4 and see why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at rootsmagic.com. Well, again, we're here at the Family History Expo in Mesa, Arizona, and I have uh, a chance to sit down and chat with Shirley Gage Hodges, um, probably a name you have seen around the internet and on articles and in books. Welcome to the podcast, Shirley. Thank you very much. Uh, good to be here. Well, when I saw that you were um, listed as one of the speakers, I thought, oh, that's it'd be nice to have a chance to sit down and actually get to visit. And I saw that you were in my last class, the... Um, inspiring ways to captivate the non-genealogist in your life. I'm curious, did you hear anything? What, did that strike a chord? And are there any projects that are your favorite types of projects? Well, I was just uh, so impressed with the Christmas tree wreath idea. Oh. I thought that was just, you know, the most marvelous thing that I'd seen <laughs> and can't wait to get home because I'm not one of the most crafty people in the world. But I think I could tackle that one. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, I think that is so wonderful. What I've done uh, for family reunions is I've made placemats with family pictures on them. Oh, uh, what a neat idea. Oh, it really worked well because, uh, as you know, some, some of our family members are not uh, <laughs> interested at all. But the conversations that started, uh, and they were trading their maps, and, uh, you know, and they were folding them up. They didn't want to use them at all. And uh, so, fortunately, I had taken a few extra. But that was really a big hit. That and, is a great uh, idea. Oh, gosh. And I was so impressed with one of my friends who was there, and I said, okay, Joe, you're already planning the candy bars to do for your family <laughs> reunion, aren't you? And she said, yes, Lisa gave us such a good idea, and that was just really fun. Well, who's going to turn down chocolate, right? That's right. Absolutely. You know, you get them where you can. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, see, now that even just surprises me because um, a lot of times when people are listening to the show or they go to a conference, they just feel like, oh, some of these speakers, they just know everything. I know when I go into classes, I pick up new things. And to think that Shirley was sitting in my class and actually nodding her head with excitement, I thought, it's so true. We all have something to learn, don't we? I never go to one of these conferences that I don't come away uh, with some fresh ideas and just a new way of looking at things, mm -hmm. which is so good. So good. So we can be a brand new beginner or we could be a seasoned veteran. It doesn't matter. It still makes... It makes it worthwhile to come and connect like this. It really does. Uh, we brought a whole carload today. There were eight oh, of us who came. And uh, from every uh, varying degrees, beginners uh, to people who've done it for a lot of years. And it's wonderful to get out and, and then compare notes afterwards and uh, just see what people have picked up and what maybe they've heard uh, before, but it didn't quite resonate with them. And mm -hmm. someone said it differently. And all of a sudden, such a spark. That's true. And it's just delightful to see. That's true. Delightful. Well, that comes from that whole idea we all have our own unique perspective and everybody's hearing something a little different. You know, it's interesting. I think the first time I came across your name was, as I recall, were you like the president of the Genealogical Speakers Society? Yes. Tell me about 
that role that you had? Well, it was really delightful. I, I actually served as two terms uh, as president, and we had speakers, of course, from all over the country, uh, some international speakers, and it was delightful to see how well we could all work together, and we had to communicate by email. Uh, we would do uh, usually the annual meeting at one of the major conferences, but we had to really get to know each other and learn about each other and just operate uh, through email, phone calls, and so forth. And it was wonderful to see how well we could work together as a group. Well, I know that you've been speaking for a long time and have that expertise, and there are probably some people who think, well, I feel like I know a little something in a particular area, and I'd, I'd like to be able to take a shot at doing a speaking engagement. What kind of advice do you have for people who might be interested in doing a presentation on genealogy? Well, I, I encourage people to try to think about an area that maybe a lot of people haven't been speaking about, uh, to really do some research on that, and then to put proposals out. and. Uh, Sometimes people are a little bit hesitant to do that, but uh, really get out there, and um, I encourage people to start volunteering at their local societies, uh, get a little more comfortable with the speaking aspect, and uh, then join uh, something like the Guild. And one of the things that we did accomplish uh, while I was serving is we set up a mentoring program so that some of the newer people coming in could uh, match up with one of the older, uh, more experienced speakers, let's say. <laughs> there you go, more experienced. And, uh, they had someone to go to for questions and that sort of thing, and that was uh, really interesting from uh, both parts of the uh, operation, uh, both for the older experienced and, and the younger person coming in. And uh, to try to ask questions and uh, uh, go out there and, and speak uh, to as many groups as they can where they really get comfortable and then start uh, applying to some of the state conferences and uh, other expos and things like that. And there is a process to applying, as you were talking about. They, yes. they call it the call for papers, yes. and we've all gotten very familiar with it. But I remember the first time I tried to respond to a call for papers, it was kind of daunting, and it seemed like there were all these rules, and I was so afraid I was going to make a mistake, and they were going to throw mine out the window. Um, how do people, if they would like to try and apply, how do they find out about the call for papers? Well, uh, you could go to uh, some of the sites and uh, put out uh, in Google. Uh, I use Google extensively and type in uh, called uh, papers uh, for genealogy, but also uh, if they go to the Guild page, uh, under the members page, there is a section where there's a call uh, for papers and uh, to start looking in those areas. And then to just approach some of the local societies and uh, get in with them and even at the state level. Yeah, I and, think that's uh, a great idea is when you mm -hmm. go to your... To Local societies always need speakers, sure. don't they? And they can't always afford to hire and bring in some, you know, national speaker, but they could mm -hmm. certainly use somebody with expertise in their own hometown. Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, we, you know, we can't all be experts on, uh, on everything, and so there's so many people out there that we can bring in uh, that will be just so enlightening to people. Mm -hmm. Well, let's switch gears a little bit because I noticed you were teaching on immigration. Tell us what the name of your class was and what you were trying to convey to students. Uh, I call it Immigration, uh, the Journey to America. And I really want people to understand how hard it was for our people to come. Uh, so I don't always dwell on, on just the records, but really how difficult it was for them to be able to afford the passage, what they experienced when they were coming uh, through, and uh, then what they did when they got to America and how difficult it was for them. Yeah. And that's probably a part that doesn't always get communicated in the records. We're not going to see that. But there are people who have documented that, who take what pull from diaries and journals and that kind of thing. And it was a harrowing experience at times. I, and I'm always shocked. I mean, I, it took me a long time to go overseas. I mean, some of these people were traveling across the world, and, you know, back when it was horse and carriage days. Oh, absolutely. When we think of how much our ancestors traveled, it just amazes me. And, you know, to find out that they walked across Michigan, uh, or they, you know, uh, they walked all along the Erie Canal because they couldn't afford the passage and that sort of thing. And to uh, find out how determined, how resilient they were, and what they really went through to make us who we are. That's what struck me about the, the, the take that you took on that class, if you will, mm -hmm. that you were communicating that. Because I feel like when we learn that about our ancestor, we just 
just our own stock goes up just a little bit. You know what I mean? You start to realize I could do these hard things that I'm trying to face, but this is nothing compared to that. That's for sure. <laughs> it really is. Uh, I have two daughters, and um, we have a grandmother uh, many generations back who actually saved the family because they were starving to death, and uh, the men in the community went out to find uh, something to eat. They, the families were all literally starving. And while they're gone, my grandmother uh, saw deer swimming out in Stone Lake, which is in Cassopolis, Michigan. Uh, she took the canoe out, she drowned the deer, and she hauled it back to shore. And she had twins one, one month later. So when my daughters or I are going through something uh, kind of desperate and we get a little down on the mouth or a little teary, I say, now what would Grandma T-Cert have done? You know, we just got a bucket up here. Oh, you look at that. We're not trying to drown a deer here. You can do this. <laughs> That's right. I mean, you know, I'm such a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, we have to think about what they went through. And, uh, you know, they certainly were sturdy people, uh, mm -hmm. very resilient. And we need to look to that and, and sometimes gather up a little of their courage. Yeah, absolutely. How long have you been doing genealogy research? I started about 40 years ago. Uh, my only goal was to find a Revolutionary War ancestor or a Civil War ancestor. Uh, I found my Civil War ancestor. Uh, but I think I probably will never find my American Revolutionary War ancestor. I have discovered uh, several long lines of Quakers. That's not to say that I won't, uh, because they certainly could have been involved in some way. But uh, it doesn't look real promising at this point. <laughs> so I may have to still eventually. Back there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What keeps you motivated today? You know, you'd think after 40 years you'd have it all. Do you have it all? No, okay. I never will have it all. Uh, mostly, I think I'm motivated because I want to find the stories. And I really want to be able to tell, you know, what happened to them between that birth and that time they spent in the rocking chair. And I want to uh, also relate to them uh, how they were impacted by our history of our country. I'm probably more of a historian almost than a genealogist. And so I really want to know how they they interacted with history and uh, what they did to develop the land. And so I keep digging for those stories. So I'll never be done. I'll never be done. I love that. Um, that kind of speaks to my own personal um, feelings about it because I love the idea that um, our family is connected to this country. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's not a detached thing, and it doesn't even matter if they only came 100 years ago. Right. Any stories that have really jumped out to you that you keep looking back on with awe and amazement? Oh, with awe and amazement and a little humility. Uh, one of my favorite ancestors to research was a gentleman by the name of Larkin Williams. I searched for him for 35 years. And I had a picture of him uh, that my mother had given me, and it said that they were my mother's grandparents. And after uh, about 35 years, I discovered that he had left Cassopolis, Michigan, and gone to Iowa. And we winter in Arizona, so three years ago, my husband said to me, uh, if you want to go back to Iowa, we'll go for a few days and research. Oh, that's a nice country. Oh, it was wonderful. Uh, we got there, and uh, I did all the courthouse research, of course. I uh, found the uh, Baptist church that he had founded. Uh, the historian let me go through all the records. I found where his wife, uh, parents had even come back to Michigan. I uh, went out to the cemetery, had a wonderful visit with him, found the stagecoach stop that he'd founded, and then I discovered he was not my grandfather. Wow. He was an uncle by marriage. Oh. And fortunately, I saw a couple of little red flags, and I so wanted to ignore them. But I couldn't. And uh, after I made my discovery, I came back and, to Michigan, and I typed up everything that I had found in Iowa. And I had a healthy stack of paperwork by that time. And uh, I entered everything on the Iowa Gen Web. And within three weeks, I had an email from one of Larkin's real granddaughters. Oh. And she said, can you tell me the name of our grandmother's parents? And I couldn't stand it. I called her on the phone, and I said, honey, <laughs> I can tell you the name of your grandmother's parents. I haven't got a clue who mine are. And uh, since then, I have found more work. I, I believe that Larkin and I are going to be more directly connected. Our families intermarried a lot. But um, I am a columnist for the Global Gazette, and so I wrote an article about six months ago about my search for Larkin and how one little hint can be so misleading. And within three days, I had an email from another of Larkin's granddaughters, and she said she had never seen the picture that I put up of her grandparents. And so that has been my most uh, interesting, <laughs> probably humiliating, <laughs> because I had told every people, every society that I knew that I had at last oh. found my grandfather.
<laughs> but you know, just as it was robbed from you, mm-hmm. it turned around and became this immense joy of being able to give it to somebody else. Absolutely. And to make people understand that we do have to be so careful. Yeah. We yeah. do have to be willing to admit when we've made a mistake. And uh, that doesn't always come easy. But I could uh, see it be really easy to go, mm, yeah, oh, yeah. I don't think I'll forget about that. <laughs> yeah, I just so wanted to, you know, we'll just overlook that little thing. Yeah. But yeah. there's a part in your heart you uh-huh. can't do that. Uh-huh. <laughs> And he was a grand old gentleman. I would have been delighted to have had him as a grandfather. And he and my grandmother, uh, supposedly, are probably up there twirling around in heaven thinking, who is that girl who thinks she's our granddaughter? (laughs) But as a historian, I imagine you just really enjoyed the journey of his story. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. And we just had a a great time doing it. And uh, I wouldn't take it back for anything. And I do know now who my grandfather is. Oh, good. Oh, good. (laughs) Now, you mentioned the Global Gazette, and that's um, a a website that you write on a regular basis. And, of course, that's just another wonderful example of how, whether you're blogging or you're posting an article or a web page, just putting it out there brings it back tenfold. And I was looking through some of your articles, and, and of course, the one that really caught my eye. I love the one about the gold miners that came to uh, California. But um, the CCC, tell us what the CCC is. Well, that was the... uh, conservation group in the 30s, 40s, and uh, these poor men throughout the country, of course, they had, were very destitute, their families were destitute, and the government program allowed them to work uh, for money, and most of the money was sent back to the families, and it actually was a salvation for the families. Yeah. And so many wonderful places were built, uh, parks, churches. I had an uncle who uh, worked on a church in the town that I uh, grew up in, and they built wonderful, wonderful things. And uh, so much was accomplished during that period, and I personally think it was a good program, and it's too bad we don't have something like that because it allowed the people to have respect. You know, they earned money, but they had a great deal of respect for what they were doing, and they were respected uh, because of what they were doing. And uh, so it was a very successful program. And in Michigan, we had, of course, an awful lot of forestation that was done by it. A lot of And you mentioned over 500 bridges just in Michigan were built by the Conservation Corps teams. It was just incredible. And you can imagine, um, they probably learned learned new skills, and you talked about mm-hmm. the fact that, and of course this is all in the U.S., but they had opportunities to do night classes, and of course oh, yes. a lot of these were kids who never even got to the eighth grade. Mm-hmm. So this yeah. was about educating the community. Think about it. Um, yes, giving financially, but they, like you say, they gave back self-respect, new mm-hmm. skills, education. That, to me, is really helping oh, yes. people. It was just a win-win program yeah. uh, because they, uh, their self-esteem had to be so much greater when they came out of those programs, and uh, and the help to their families was just tremendous. Well, and you were saying when they first instituted that um, program, they started in tents because they didn't have housing for these people, so their first job that they got paid to do was to build the barracks yes. for people who would come down the future. And this, the reason it's, it caught me was because my grandfather and his brothers um, joined that. They were from Oklahoma, mm-hmm. and the family family needed money desperately, and they were thrilled. It was a big deal to get signed on and accepted. Oh, yes, and, uh, you know, they, they fought forest fires. They just did so many things that uh, really helped the nation tremendously, tremendously. Now, I have to ask, because you had a wonderful link to take a look at the gal, this gal who shared her uh, Conservation Corps yes. records. Mm-hmm. <gasps> My goodness, Shirley, how do you get those? <laughs> I was looking for links. How do I get my that copies? Wasn't that wonderful? Well, uh, she's a very good friend of mine, and uh, she used to be right from the community I live in, and she's a librarian out at Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, her name is Cynthia Tuish, and I called her up, and I said, Cynthia, you've been working on this. Would you mind sharing? Because she also does a talk on it. And, of course, uh, she was very, very gracious about it. And uh, Are these you know, through the National Archives? Uh, she are these are government them? records? Yes, they were government records, and uh, she had actually found some of these, I believe, in, in a state office in another state. Oh, okay. Uh, at our archives in uh, the state of Michigan, we do have uh, some good CCC records, too. And some of the photos that I use in the articles came from the archives. Well, I've noticed that there's been kind of a renaissance of the, some of the artwork that was created during the yes. 30s and, and that yes. was commissioned. And they're really celebrating that again as a mm-hmm. true art form specific to an era. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, you know, people who had... Uh, higher educations, teachers and so forth, did incredible indexing pro, uh, projects and so forth. And so they t- tried to utilize people's skills uh, for whatever they were best at. And those who didn't necessarily have the best skills, they tried to develop them so that they could feel that they were a productive part of our economy. 
Yeah, so it was a great program. Great program. With, with all the topics that you write on, and I certainly recommend um, your articles on the Global Gazette because they're such a kind of a snapshot of all these different areas that you could possibly pursue in looking into your family history. What's next for you? What, what's your personal passion and goal? Well, <laughs> I kind of change all the time. Uh, my specialty is trying to trace women, and so I'm always uh, looking for new topics and that sort of thing. And so the last things I've been working on are uh, the Harvey Girls oh, yeah. and also the Amazing Women of the West type things. And so I'm always looking for that type of a topic that I can uh, dig in and, and study a little bit more. I guess I'm a perennial student. Uh, <laughs> I will always hope I'm learning till the day I die. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And what would you say to somebody maybe who hasn't come to a conference like we've come to this weekend and is a little timid about it? What can they get out of it? Oh, I would encourage them to go to every kind of conference that they can. Uh, start out, you know, with the smaller conferences if they're a little bit intimidated by the larger, but uh, to go to every conference they can, and uh, particularly uh, the national conferences, if they have a chance to go to those. Uh, many of the state societies have wonderful conferences. And to get out and uh, Part of the success, I believe, is that you interact with all of these other people who have the same problems. Uh, you start sharing, you find new friends and acquaintances, yeah. and just the ideas. Uh, there were eight of us sitting around the lunch table today, and just, you know, it was like ping pong table. You know, just everybody was, you know, uh, <laughs> talking about, well, what, what we were talking about was, you know, we're going to go home and make our candy bar wrappers okay. and our, our... I want pictures now. You Christmas. guys have to email me pictures. I, I love seeing the okay, examples. I will tell Joe to do that, because yeah. this girl will really uh, take a hold and do this. <laughs> and if I get my Christmas wreath made, you will get a yes. copy. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I can vouch for it's, you can only meet nice, intelligent, um, inspiring women like Shirley at conferences like this. And I'm really glad that I got a chance to meet up with you here. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so very much, Lisa. It's been a real joy. Sunny McClellan Morton, ready to take on one of a genealogist's biggest quandaries when writing their personal and family stories. What do you do with the secrets and other stuff you're not supposed to talk about? It can be fun to discover old family scandals and secrets, but some of them sting. When these secrets exist within living memory, it can be heartbreaking or embarrassing to write about bad behavior or tragedy or failure in the family. At the same time, your story may be so shaped by these that it feels dishonest to leave them out. So you write nothing? No. Let's start with personal stories. Everyone has memories they don't want to broadcast. We have the right to set boundaries. In my new book, My Life and Times, a guided journal for collecting your stories, I encourage people to document just what they're willing to. Let's say your birth father didn't stick around, but you know who he was. Write down his name. It's a genealogical fact. Write any other details you're willing to share. A physical description, a last known address, any contact you had, how you feel about him. It might be as simple as... My birth father's name was Alan Norwood. I don't know anything about him, except that I don't like him. What about other people's secrets and painful stories? Do you have a right to tell them? It is nearly impossible to write our own stories without stepping on someone else's privacy. And certainly this gets to the heart of genealogical writing. I have three thoughts on this. I believe we do have the right to talk about someone else's life as it affected ours. Maybe your story rightfully includes a parent's alcohol abuse, 
but may not extend to a sister's alcoholism if her struggle hasn't been a big part of your life. I believe we have the responsibility to consider how telling other stories may affect the family. With the alcoholic sister, for example, how will her children feel about what is written? In this day of open records and tell-all confessionals, it's easy to believe we have to tattle every tidbit in order to tell a good story. Not true. Think twice. Is it important family information, or is it gossip? If a story must be told, how can you tell it compassionately? Finally, I believe honesty is more than telling the facts without twisting them. Honesty also means admitting when we probably are too biased to be fair in our judgment. It means owning up, rather than covering up, our own role in any event. We are each as flawed as the next person. One final thought. When I started writing about my childhood, I got nervous about whether my family would agree with my version of the past. I wondered whether I should let them approve what I was writing. Finally, I decided that even though I was writing about them, this was still my story. I didn't need to speak for anyone else. They can write their own stories if they want to. And I hope they will, even if their version conflicts with mine. Next time, I'll talk about finding meaning in memories. Meaning in your own memories or someone else's. It can be a genealogist's deepest reward. Until then, this is Sunny McClellan Morton, helping you save your life, one story at a time. Find me at www.sunnymorton.com. Thanks so much for joining me for the Genealogy Gems podcast, episode number 125. Now, before I sign off, I just want to say thank you to some genealogy bloggers out there who've given me a shout out lately. The Ruth Seller Sacramento Genealogical Society posted the blog article called Searching for Common Surnames. It was about my recent speaking engagement at the Sacramento Central Public Library. I'll have a link for you in the show notes to that. Thank you so much to those folks. I had a wonderful time out in Sacramento. And genealogy blogger and podcast listener Kim Von Aspern invited me to sit down with her a few weeks ago for a one-on-one interview, and she's publishing it as a blog series on her Le Maison de Champ blog at lemaisondechamp.blogspot.com. You can check out her articles aptly named Interview with Lisa Louise Cook Part 1 and Interview with Lisa Louise Cook Part 2. And she also has an article um, with a review of my presentation in Sacramento. And I believe there are additional segments coming in the um, series on the interview. So you can check those out at Kim's blog. Thank you so much. I had a wonderful time getting together. We talked for hours. <laughs> you know how it is. Get two genealogists together. It's, it's not going to stop anytime soon. Okay, well, that's it for now. I've really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.